thanks everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so let's get this started. Um, oops. Whoa. <laughs> Shit. Okay. This is not good. Wait. Wait. That's actually the intro. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you already kind of know my background, and somehow I'm associated with AeroPage, and this is actually one of the reasons why I think I'm here. Um, so everybody knows about the, green, the blue screen of death, and, and there is one um, AeroPage that actually a lot of people liked for some reason, and I obviously have association with, with this whale. Um, so probably a lot of people know every single time Twitter go, goes down back in the days, um, there is a whale going to be showed up and lifted by little birds. And it's being named the Twitter farewell by all the lovely Twitter users. Uh, what's really interesting is that this illustration um, actually is the error message that makes users happy. Um, what's also very interesting is like we got tweets from people from around the world. And we also have all these inspired artworks from people around the world, from Japan to Australia, um, from Tokyo. This is a real life artwork. And also street art in New York. And um, Legos from uh, an actual engineer from Denmark. He used to be a spaceship uh, in, like, engineer designer for Lego. Um, the other really interesting thing is Singapore um, government actually used it as a public transit uh, poster. Uh, the most in interesting to me is the cakes, obviously. You know, we got to have cakes. It's 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and, you know, we have cake. We also got to have drinks. Um, so there is a farewell pale ale beer label contest in New York. Um, and I was actually one of the judges. This was the winner. And on the other side is at the Shorty Awards in New York. This is back in 2009. Uh, they actually serve all the people coming to the award, the, sh the, the fail whale um, martini. I had seven, I think. I was totally <laughs> smashed. Um, there's also a lot of inspired um, different makeup tutorials and also all sorts of different fun fashion stuff, accessories inspired by the colors. Um, and Halloween seasons, there's all kinds of different hats coming out. My favorite thing is actually on the, on the right is an uh, Adobe engineer. And then he kind of posted it on, on during the, during the um, Halloween season. He made it in, uh, and wore it to the, to the workspace. Um, and somebody loved it so much and tattooed it on the leg. Uh, <laughs> and um, what's also really fascinating is that um, it was also being uh, put it onto the CNN. And so a little bit about me. My name is Yi Ying Lu. Uh, Yi means happy, and Ying means creative, and Lu means land. Uh, so happy creative land. And if you want to pronounce my name right, you have to smile, because it's Yi Ying. Uh, so I was born in Shanghai, China. I uh, moved to Sydney, Australia when I was a teenager. Um, and I uh, you know, studied um, uh, visual communication in Sydney, Australia. And, and then I also moved to London um, to study advertising and illustration. Um, and for some reason, um, I have this association with uh, Silicon Valley and, and San Francisco, which is, I think, partially because of this tech community um, embraced the art in the, in the first place. And so I'm, right now, I'm, I'm living in San Francisco, but I do travel around the world. Um, and in the past three years, I've been creative director at this uh, company called 500 Startups, and it was a, um, a VC firm, but also it's an accelerator, com uh, it's an accelerator um, program for startups around the world. And I also had the fortune to work with a lot of uh, different advertising agencies, um, including clients from um, Disney to Microsoft. Uh, and I was very happy to really being able to find a way to connect art and tech. So my passion is try to uh, highlight the fun out of function. Because if you look at the word function, it has a fun in it. And it just a lot of times, people look at things um, and don't really see the fun aspects from it, the, really the enjoyment, the amusement, or the lighthearted pleasure. And if you look at the traditional tech error message uh, page, the function is actually the same as the, as the whale, right? It's basically the, the content is exactly the same. It's telling people something goes wrong and um, you, know, you need to be aware of it. But what's really interesting is the blue screen of death didn't actually have all these 
fans uh, doing all these different things, but this whale somehow um, resonated in people. And I think the other thing that's really interesting is that there's not a lot of words here. Um, so if you speak in English as your first language, obviously the blue screen of death, you can read the message. But if you don't speak it as a first language, it's just a bunch of squiggles. And yet this illustration somehow communicated through art which is the color, the shape, the form, and it transcends the linguistic barrier. And so this is probably the reason why that a lot of people from around the world, whether Japan or, or Australia or um, Africa or Argentina, people feel resonate even though they don't necessarily speak English as the first language. And so what's also really fascinating to see is that there's so many tech companies started to also uh, implement their arrow page or important pages um, on their product, whether it's a website or app, and started to integrate artworks into their product or arrow pages so that it communicate better and it also communicate the technology failure in a human way. And people will be able to have more relate to it and in some way, it also plant the seed of empathy into their product. So it's really fascinating to see all these different interpretations. And also, it somehow showcase the, the company culture as well. Um, so the first takeaway I'd like to give you is I for Integrate, which is encourage and enable more and more specialists from different areas to work together and putting the fun into the functional. Here's a, a little thing. Um, I actually never really kind of uh, giving a, a chance to talk about it publicly. Um, the the, the Fairwell's original name is actually not called the Fairwell. It's called Lifting a Dreamer. And the, the initial um, idea of the illustration was actually I was um, back in school when I was in my final year at university in Australia, in New South Wales. Um, I missed my friends from around the world because I've been traveling around the world and um, I wanted to communicate this idea that, you know, I wanted to be there for your birthday, I wanted to be there for anniversary or graduation, but physically I couldn't be everywhere. So I wanted to express this message and I realized that what I study was visual communication. And I thought, well, why don't we communicate this visually? So I then thought, uh, because I live in New South Wales, um, this wish of, you know, this wish of my expression was so big, I wanted to um, symbolize it. And I think whale would be a great um, symbolism. And I have this imaginary um, big wish it's so big and so huge, like the whale, and I have the little birds carry this huge wish across the ocean for you. Obviously, in reality, whale couldn't fly, but this is the magic of art. This is the magic of, um, this, this, is, this is the magic of colors and forms. It could really make and transcend the reality and, ex and make this expression um, become magical and possible. Um, so I think the, the other story that I also kind of never really tell about it is um, regardless of all these press, regardless of a lot of um, interests, I was in my very early days of my career. So I literally just graduated 10 years ago and I started to have all these different projects coming in and um, I was a young artist and um, very excited about all these um, opportunities. But in the same time, I remember um, I had this huge creative blockage, huge blockage, uh, creative blockage around 2009, 2010. The reason why is because, number one, I was still very young and I realized that there was, I go to bookshops and I realized there's stationaries that using my artwork without my permission. And I would go to some, some cities and I would see some of my artwork was being used as a big campaign and I never knew about it. And so all these things started to consume me as, as a creative person and I didn't know what to react. And one of the things I did was um, I was uh, stopped creating. I think I stopped creating for about six months, 
I was not able to do any new work because I thought, what's the point of me continue creating new work if I can't protect them? And obviously, I tried you know, to look at different ways of protecting it, you know, copyright, and they all cost a lot, a fortune. You, it actually costs you a fortune to register copyright and all that. So um, I remember I was trying to find a solution, and I turned to comedy. Um, so I watched heaps of YouTube videos and, and comedy. I try to kind of keep my spirit up. Because only if I'm spirit, like my spirit is up, then I will be able to have the strength to keep working. And I stumble upon this, like this, this, this comedian, this talk show host, who I have never seen his work before 2009. And he was also in the midst of a bit of a struggle with a big network, TV network. And I'm sure you probably guessed, um, and that was Conan O'Brien. So I didn't know any of Conan's work before I stumble on this. Um, video and it's happened to be his uh, a goodbye speech on Tonight Show, and I remember it was a two-minute speech. So I only show you the last bits, which is ten minute, sorry, ten second, um, and um, and this is this is the first time I'm encountering Conan, and um, somehow it gave me the strength back. Nobody in life gets exactly what they thought they were going to get, but if you work really hard and you're kind. Amazing things will happen. I'm telling you, amazing things will happen. I'm telling you, it's just true. So, so I remember I, wa I watched the entire two, two minute of his, his speech and I was in tears. Um, and I was like, who is this person? Um, I don't even know who is this, but like, why am I and I'm not crying? This is crazy. And, um, and so um, his, his word, if you work hard, and you're kind, amazing things gonna happen has been my, uh, my mantra um, since then. And, and I watched more and more comedy and I was, I was able to back to work. I was able to um, have, the, have the confidence and have the faith to come back to work because I believe that if you're, if you're being given a gift, you need to share, you need to, you need to really go back to your home to work. And little that I know, after about eight months, I received an email from TVS out of blue. And it was, uh, I was in Sydney, Australia, and I was very puzzled because there was no phone call, nothing. It was just an email coming from TVS. Um, and I was like, is that a scam? Uh, I was really not sure what to react. And it turns out Conan actually uh, running his new show on TBS, and, and um, they, they're contacting me to create this artwork for Conan's new show and also for his website. So um, this was almost like a physical manifestation of what Conan was saying. Um, and so I, I was, I, again, I was in tears. I, I thought this was, this was really a gift. So I was, I was very happy that I get a chance to work <laughs> again. It was, it's called the Conan Pale Whale because Conan is very pale and he's riding a whale. Um, and it was used for his, his new show on TBS in 2011. And, uh, and also, it's in, until t today, it's still on his website. So if you just type in Team Coco forward slash 404, you'll see this. Um, so, and I also get a chance to see him in person. <laughs> He's re really, really tall. Um, I, I was giving him like a music box and I was jumping and I just thought that was like, this is what it's supposed to be. Um, so this is, this is um, my, my little experience. This is the first time I'm actually sharing this. So I'm getting a little bit emotional. Um, and I, I also get a chance to be tweeted by him. And he, <laughs> so, um, so this this was the, the the bonus story. I literally decided to put put in this story today. So, I'm really glad that you hear this story for the first time. Um, so the bonus takeaway here is if you work hard and if you're kind, amazing things is gonna happen. And that's that's by Conan O'Brien. Um, so the second project, or the second takeaway I would like to introduce is N for Nurture. Um, this is 
actually something to do with all the emojis. Uh, so there's four emojis on your phone, which is being released last year in November. Um, so the dumpling, the chopstick, the, the takeout box, and the fortune cookie. And I designed the original uh, Unicode uh, emojis for those. So the, the, the above one is from Apple, and the, the, you know, the second row was from me. Um, and this project is conceived by me and my friend Jenny A. Lee, who's a writer, who was an ex-New York Times writer and now a uh, founder um, uh, in lives in San Francisco. Um, she runs a literature studio called Plimpton. So in 2015, both Jenny and I, we moved to San Francisco separately. We met um, eight years ago in New York. And we haven't talked since, I mean, meet in person uh, since like 2009 to 2015. So we finally met up in person uh, through dumplings. She messaged me and she said, hey, why don't we go and have some dumplings? And I was very excited. And I tried to text her, message her back with a dumpling emoji. And I only found out that dumpling emoji is not existing on the keyboard. Um, so I was like, there's no, there's no dumpling emoji. How is that possible? And she's like, oh, good point. Uh, so I was like, OK, this is not leading anywhere. Uh, and I am an artist. Uh, well, and I have my imagination. So I should probably do something about it. So I went back to my table, and I decided to create this, um, this very, uh, it's not even a beta. I think it's alpha version of a dumpling emoji. And I put hearts in it. it it's being called the, the bling bling dumpling, because it blings. Um, so uh, I sent it back to her, and she liked it. And then later on, we realized that uh, dumpling is actually very universal. Georgia have kinkali, Japan has gyoza, Korea have mandu, Italy have ravioli, Polish people have pierogi, you know, Russian people have palmini and empanadas, you know, like kreplech. Uh, Chinese people have pot stickers and momos and mentees. You can see I've done a lot of research. <laughs> it's actually a group effort. You'll see it later on. It's a group effort. And um, uh, Germans have Mautagen. Uh, so it's a group effort. It's not just me. It's a group of people um, that, uh, you know, uh, really close friends who are passionate about food and also wanting to make this available onto the keyboard. So these are uh, volunteers and friends and decided to form this very serious um, organization called Emoji Nation. And I did the logo as well, very professional, serious looking logo. Um, so we run a, a Kickstarter campaign on Kickstarter because we realized, uh, we realized that in order to uh, have the emoji uh, being available onto people's phone, you have to go through a very rigorous approval process. Um, so there is this non-for-profit non organization in Silicon Valley called Unicode. And this organization literally decides what's being published onto every single phone, whether it's iOS or Android or other phones. So we have to go through the whole process of being approval. So we went through this whole process, and we talked to people who are the committees. And they came back to me and said, well, we really like it. But if you look at most of the food emoji, it doesn't have a face on it. I was like, no. If you look at the fry, it has a little face on it. It's like, that doesn't care. Uh, I really think it's like it's there. It's just. It's like the fun in a function thing again. Um, so anyway, they, they're like, no, we, we, don't, we don't want the face, so we want, we want it to have no face. Um, so I removed the face, but it's not as interesting as, as it used to be. Um, so then they also told me that most of the food emoji are 45 degrees, very specific. So <laughs> again, I had to stare at a dumpling for a long time to come up with this kind of universal looking uh, a dumpling. It's kind of like a shell. And, um, and so I presented to them, and they said, OK, this is good. And we, we love this. But we also have a lot of requests uh, for a takeout box, chopsticks, and fortune cookie. Can you also like 
make it happen because it would be really, really, really great to submit it as a series. And I said, sure, I would love to do this. So I came back and I kind of came up with these initial designs. Um, and so a, a few months later, we presented at IBM with the um, with one of the committee, um, Peter, and also one of the board member, Alalita, tweeted about the picture when we presented. But what's really interesting is Unicode is not just people in presence. There are also a lot of virtual uh, committees there. So Bobby, who is actually linguistic, who lives in Taiwan, tweeted back in real time and said that the cross chopstick actually means impolite in China and Japan to the elders. And I'm like, ah, oh, I'm a Chinese person. I, did, I had no idea. I had no idea about this tradition. And so, but then I kind of, I kind of recall the fact that if you look at, if you, you do understand, or if you do like um, sort of study Chinese, you would know that there is um, traditional Chinese and simplified Chinese. Obviously, the traditional Chinese characters has more strokes, and the simplified Chinese actually has a, a, a lot less strokes compared with the traditional version. And so, in a way, it's kind of the culture evolves, and there is some sort of loss in translation as the language evolves. So that's probably the reason why a lot of older or like traditional traditions uh, are gradually being forgotten. Um, so I, I thought I wanted. To to honor this, I did some research on the internet, and I was like, "Okay, this is this is legit. Uh, we got to put it back." So I decided to to really kind of listen and take the advice and um, redesign the chopstick, and also integrate the chopstick into the takeout box as well, so that it kind of has the continuity. Um, and so this was the final design. And I submitted it. And now it's available on your phone, uh, whether you're using Android or, or Apple. Um, but what's also very interesting, it was being released last year uh, in November. But what also is very interesting is although um, iOS, Apple was basically, their design was based on the original design. It's pretty close to my original design. Um, the other company, however, have very different interpretation of dumplings. And they have like xiaolongbao and, and, and mantou. Uh, or the other one, like the Twitter one looks like a, uh, like a mosquito took a lot of bite of it. <laughs> Uh, of, of a bun. Uh, anyway, so, so to me, it was quite interesting because Unicode has this unified language, which is kind of defeats the purpose of having a, 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 like a unified, because every single company wanted to self-express themselves. So I thought, I really want to do something in order to uh, put back the bling bling down plane, because I really like uh, giving this um, almost personified version of a dumpling. So uh, I was very lucky uh, to be invited to come to Shanghai uh, last year by IDEO um, as their first artist in resident in, in China. And this is also very interesting because I really had no idea what is going to be. And they said, hey, we want you to be there uh, in Shanghai for, for two weeks. And what we want you to do is that we would like to have you be in the space, co-work with our people. And, and it doesn't matter if it's designers or, or uh, tech, uh, tech people or um, even accountants or uh, legal people. You, what you wanted to do is you wanted to talk to different people in a company. And really, it's almost like a little creative gym. Like, get them going. And I'm not a personal trainer, because I, I don't think I'm capable of doing that. But I think it's in a way, it's kind of like you're getting a chance to really interact and work on separate projects. But also get inspiration from each other. So you invite them to your space, and you tell them what you're working on, or you get some feedback from them. In the same time, they're also getting some creative juice flowing. So it's kind of a creative gem. So then I did not know what exactly I'm going to do. But the requirement is by the end of the two weeks, you are going to have something tangible to present to the team. And also, in the course of two weeks, you're trying to engage with as many people as possible who are in the company. So at the time, I had no idea how is this going to be related to the dumpling emoji, because the dumpling emoji is already done. It's already in everybody's iPhone and, and Android and other phones. So um, I started to talk to people. I started to ask people. Originally, I wanted to do a Zodiac project. But I then realized people love food. 
and they just love dumplings. And in Shanghai, dumpling is a huge thing. Uh, in China, especially, there's all kinds of different dumplings. And it's specifically, one of the most common kind of dumpling in China is called wonton, which in English is, is wonton. In Chinese, it's huandun. And then I started to be like a lot of people started to tell me that why don't you do a dumpling character? Why don't you make it into a, a like a dumpling artwork and then make it personified as you want it in the first place um, to like have a bling bling dumpling 2.0? And I thought, well, that's interesting. And then my friend, um, my 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 colleague or friend, they, they they started to ask, what's the deal with wonton? And I started to do research and I realized that the Chinese character wonton or huandun is originated from the same pronunciation huandun, which means primordial chaos. So this is getting very deep. So what happened is that I started to realize that during Ming Dynasty, which is the 1300 to 600, the classic mountain and sea actually had an illustrated version of the wonton uh, dumpling or wonton, the primordial chaos. And this is mind blowing because then if you look at all the dumplings around the world, every single dumpling that you know is some sort of um, you know, pocket. It's some sort of inside things being wrapped around by flowers or whatever pocket is going to be wrapped around it. And you only take a bite, then you know what's inside. So in a way, it's a symbolism to kind of almost celebrate the fact that, you know, the Big Bang, which is you taking a bite, and the universe begins from this chaos. Um, so I thought, well, this is, this is really interesting. And I wanted to have this animated character to, to really kind of um, make it into something that gives some reference back to the wonton monster back in the days in the Ming Dynasty. So I come up with this, which is a, a wonton character. <laughs> Um, and, I, and because it's a, it's a little wonton dumpling, you take a bite of it, you kind of take a bite of the chaos, and then you form, the, you form this new order, this new universe. So I, I came up with this character called Tiny Chaos. And Tiny Chaos has all sorts of different activities. And these activities, are, some of them are from me, some of them are being suggested by, uh, by different uh, colleagues at uh, IDEO. And um, I basically have sort of, uh, this, is, well, like, this is like informal uh, creative sessions. So people come in and people can start to draw or just write down ideas. It doesn't matter. You can just participate uh, in, a, in, a, in a, hello? <laughs> you can you, you can participate and you can write down what you want it want what you want to see, um, and I will translate um, some of my favorite into characters. Uh, what's more interesting is these digital characters. These digital I call them stickers uh, can be also. <laughs> this is the international version. So we have the New York one, the the uh, Munich one, and the uh, Mexico one. So um, all these characters can also be translated into stickers. And in China, a lot of them. Uh, using WeChat. So then it could be used on WeChat instantly. As soon as the, the GIF is being, or GIF, whatever you prefer, is being created, um, you can actually import it into WeChat and you can use it, like you can start it to use it as a way of communication right away. Um, and the other thing I did is um, I decided to also have a physical copy of the artwork um, to almost have a sort of physical presence of the work after I left the, the office. Um, so everybody gets a print as a gift, uh, like a gift of my stay at, uh, at IDEO. Some of them getting the print that the the little tiny chaos that they suggested, or their favorite um, pose of the, the tiny chaos. And, and it's, a, it's a wonderful way, really, kind of getting to know all these people in a very short of time, a very, very short, two weeks. But it also um, was an amazing um, sort of, it, it's amazing experience to kind of see how people work. I got some really, really interesting idea, not necessarily all from designers. I got some really interesting idea from the um, I was so amazed by even the accountants. They they said, "Oh, I'm not, I'm not, I can't draw, but I can, I can probably give you some ideas." And and it really changed the way that I see people, and also it changed the way the people in the office see themselves. 
Um, and it's also really amazing. It was originally just a tiny little idea. I kind of like, oh, there's no dumpling emoji in the phone. And a year, no, actually two years later, it became the emoji on everybody's phone. But in the same time, it became this creative project, which hopefully is going to be ongoing. And also we have all these stickers on WeChat. And so the takeaway here is, and for nurture, be ready to capture idea anywhere and really execute them with people who can help you to cultivate and foster its development. So this is the second takeaway. Um, the third one I'd like to give you is uh, as for symbolize. This is, a, this is a, a kind of a different project. This is a project that I did for the China Australian Millennial Project, and it's called CAMP. And it's the, wor the world first bicultural incubator for uh, young Chinese and Australian entrepreneurs. It was a three-month incubator program. So they have people from uh, China and Australia to come together and climb the Sydney Harbor Bridge, but most importantly, form business ideas online and offline. They get a chance to meet each other in Sydney for two weeks and also they get a chance to actually um, uh, present these ideas to um, investors and venture capitalists and uh, get a chance to really uh, take this onto a stage and the winner will also get a lot of um, resources from um, this from this amazing event so the challenge here is they wanted to have identity that symbolize the duality of the bicultural and also um, bilingual um, incubator but in the same time there needed to have some sort of symbolism of growth as well as it needed to ha somehow show it is multidisciplinary as well because there is a 15 thinking tanks and I thought well what's interesting, I was looking at it, is the tangram, which is a puzzle that consists of seven flat shapes. And it can put it together hundreds of thousands of different um, combinations. And so this is actually quite interesting, because this would be able to form this idea of growth. In this case, the metaphor from the caterpillar to the cocoon, and in the end, to the butterfly. And also, it meets the requirement of the duality, because you have the butterfly. But in the same time I was doing user testing, I asked people, can you see it's a butterfly? And people were like, oh, it, yeah, I can see that, but it's not, it's not that obvious. So then I thought, well, wait a minute. If you look at the character from the English and the Chinese, people, the character people, looks like that. And it looks like the antenna of the butterfly. And you put it together, it's actually two kinds of people meet and at the bridge. It also symbolized for the, um, the bridge climbing activity. And this is the birth of the Australian Chinese Millennial Project. And in the same time, it had a chance to be on the screen uh, and also the color being represented in all kinds of different collaterals. Um, and uh, so this is the project of the sort of uh, bilingual, biculture um, project camp. So the, the takeaway from this is S for symbolize, which is using metaphors and symbols to tell stories and articulate abstract concepts. Now, the next project I'd like to introduce is P for personify. This is also another very different project than the previous ones. This is a, um, a branding project I did for a company back in the days in Australia called Go Sushi. Um, and this, and it was uh, during the financial crisis, and it wasn't doing very well. So they came to me and they said, "Hey, can you do something for us?" And I said, "Maybe we can start from the logo." Um, so, so I came up with the the uh, the whole design and execution, and then we re we rename it as Wasabi Warrior. Um, and I came up with this. Um, whole army, this is the main character, which is the, the wasabi warrior. And I also come up with the whole brother army, uh, which actually serves a function, because every single brother has very different personality and also very different ingredients. So ocean is seafood, pork, porky is pork, beefy is beef, and uh, veggie is vegetable, obviously, and chicken. Um, and it also being reflected in a store design uh, from stores around Australia and now around the world. So they have opened more than 50 uh, stores in Australia. And very, very recently, they also opened up uh, like uh, new stores in Hong Kong and also in Philippines. 
So it was a very interesting kind of um, success. And I was able to know that now they're a multi-million dollar turnover company. So the takeaway from this is people personify, which is give personalities to your product or your service. And it helps users to resonate more with what you do, which also lead more sales, obviously. The next one I'm very excited to show you guys is I for Infuse, and it's a project that I did for Shanghai Disneyland. Um, so back in the days in 2000, this is, this is in 2016 when it opens, and it looks fabulous. But back in the days in 2014, it actually looks like this. And it is still under construction, and uh, the Disney people come to me and said, we needed to hire a lot of people when we open. Uh, we probably got to hire uh, 10,000 people. And we would like to have you to work on our recruitment campaign. So we already decide that we will have these five main characters, which is Mickey stands for magic, Simba stands for growth, Mulan stands for courage, Elsa for dream, and Snow White uh, stands for female leadership. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so, uh, and also the team, obviously, it's important, not just the CEO, you've got to have the teamwork. Um, so then I, I, I was looking at it, I was like, cool. But if, if, if you look closer, they're not, like, they're not even the same species, for God's sake. They're, they're very different genres, and they're not even the same species, let, let alone you know, um, you know, colors and everything. Like, how do you make sure that it's actually unified? And, uh, and if, it, like, if you look at Mulan, like, she's the Chinese person, right? And then like, Elsa wasn't even very Chinese. Um, so so I, I was like, so what is something that I can use? to be able to transcend this cultural difference. And um, I turned my inspiration to the Chinese folk art, which is paper cut. Um, and so what I did was I was looking at a lot of Chinese paper cut motif and, and apply them into, um, into the actual design. So for example, the lucky swirl cloud into the Mickey Mouse. And uh, my favorite is actually the, uh, the little tiger shoe, which is little protection for babies um, in the tradition uh, onto Mickey Mouse's shoes. And this is Mickey. And so in this case, Simba was also a huge challenge because what I was being told is that they said we would like to have the little Simba together with the adult Simba because it's important to have this growth and we wanted to have both characters on the same page. But I said, well, if you have the, both of them in the same page, people would think the adult Simba is Mufasa, which is the dead. Uh, so well, what's the solution of that? I started to kind of watch the, the, the movie for another 10 times. <laughs> that's, that's option number one. And then I, I was looking at the traditional motif of where the, the storyline was coming from, which is African totem. And I started to draw inspiration from the, the totems. And I thought, oh, actually, we, what we can do is, if you, if you remember, there is one uh, scene that uh, has the little, to the little sort of tattoo of Simba, the, the tiny Simba. So I apply that sort of design of tattoo onto the adult Simba. So this was, in, in translation, actually, this means like little guy will become a big uh, hero in, in, the, in the legendary stories. So this is Sim the Simba. And Mulan, in this case, is also quite interesting because I thought, well, I really wanted to also introduce the idea of Mulan, the name in Chinese, actually means magnolia flower. So in China, people actually knew about it. But in, in America or elsewhere, if you don't speak Chinese, you don't know her name actually means the magnolia flower. And if you watch the animation, the reoccurring uh, magnolia flower, which symbolizes strength and beauty, is actually a, like a subliminal message. And I kind of wanted to have that message there, too, to honor where her name is coming from and what it symbolizes. So I, I, I got a lot of inspiration from Magnolia Flower, and I kind of try to integrate it not only onto the background, but also onto the foreground. So this is Mulan. Elsa, in this case, there's nothing really Chinese here, <laughs> honestly. So I was like, OK, so what am I going to do with this? 
uh, we got to make sure it's, it's being localized and also not losing its authenticity in the first place. Um, so I drew the inspiration of, again, the paper cut and a lot of Scandinavian, like they have or Russian ballet uh, patterns and I started to kind of draw these inspirations. Um, and so this was the final uh, design of um, Elsa. Again, the, the hair was uh, very much traditional Chinese paper cut, but it, you still can see you know, where she's coming from. Uh, in this case, for the female CEO, uh, I thought, uh, it, and they also said we needed to have the whole team there. It's not just her. We, we want to make sure we have all the seven dwarfs be included in the actual final design. Um, so I thought, well, the, uh, the forest could be an interesting theme. Um, so I drew a lot of inspiration from the plants and animals from the forest, and this is the final design of um, the whole team. So this is Snow White and Seven Dwarfs. And this is the actual uh, design in situation during the recruitment process. And, and it's always very, very uh, interesting to see uh, you know, the work is being integrated into the actual recruitment uh, campaign and how people interacting with it as printouts or as banners. And finally, they were able to recruit 10,000 people um, out of 70,000 applicants. And this is the uh, Shanghai Disneyland recruitment campaign. So the takeaway from this project is that I for Infuse, um, which is really kind of to learn the target market's local customs, and they, they needed to be recognized, respect, and also infused into design. As many companies growing global, it is absolutely important to study about their custom, their tradition, and also uh, respect the history. This one is fun. This is Alpha Research. So this is a project I did when I was working as a creative director of 500 Startups. Uh, so this is, um, 500 Startups uh, uh, is a, a, a VC firm, but it's also an accelerator for global company and, and entrepreneurs around the world. So two years ago, it started to um, branching into the Indian market. So at the time, I needed to design a logo for 500 India, and I don't speak Indian. I mean, I don't speak Indian language. There's, uh, there's more to it. I don't speak in Indian language, and the challenge number one is I actually had no idea how many languages is in India and what exactly is the main language in India. So the challenge number one is in global, um, sort of global brand, we use 500, which is the Arabic number. The funny thing is, a lot of people thought that Hindi is the, you know, the only language in India. And in Hindi, though, it looks like a 400. Um, so that's the first challenge. And I was looking at it, I was like, well, does that mean like if you're local, you get $100 off? Um, so obviously, we cannot use Hindi because uh, it looks like a 400. It's confusing. So that idea is coming out of the way. And so then I decided to spell it out in Hindi of 500 being spelled out in Hindi. But the challenge number two is I realized after talking to colleagues and doing research that there, is, there are about 122 languages in India. And Hindi is just one of the 20 plus official language that's spoken in India. Not everyone in the country speaks Hindi. So that's a huge challenge. So what am I going to do with this? That means like, we're going to have more than 20 different logos. Um, so then I collect different spellings of 500 being spelled out in, in the, you know, the main official languages, which is about 15 official languages. And the next thing I want to do is looking at the color scheme of the flag, of um, Indian flag, and then combining the Indian flag colors and also the original 500 global logo and having that 14 or 15 main languages surrounded um, around the 500 official logo, which is the global logo. And this is the solution of 500 India. Um, and I'm really glad in the end everybody was happy about it. But it also taught me a lesson to really kind of do a huge amount of different researches. And a lot of times you can't just decide with your limited knowledge. So R for research, which is really kind of understand and learn the target market. Sorry, this is the wrong one. To, to really kind of learn what exactly is the language and the difference in the target 
um, market and for the local um, languages and traditions. The last one is E for Engage. Um, so again, this is a project uh, I'm very excited to introduce. In 2011 to 2013, there is this company called Visually. And Visually is a probably very uh, well-established uh, infographic company. And what happened is that uh, in 2000, uh, they get acquired in 2016. What happened is in 2014, this platform decided to have uh, a expansion and they decided to pivot into a creative content marketplace and so they're no longer just doing infographics but they want to attract content creators like designers animators journalists etc and so they wanted to launch their campaign at South by Southwest and there's so many people coming to South by as we all know and the South by trade show is massive and so they want to kind of stand out of the crowd and in competition with NASA and New York Times just across their, their, um, uh, their table. Um, and they told me that the original logo somehow also needed to be integrated into this new campaign, but we are gonna do it in a different way. Uh, so we are not gonna give up the original logo, but in the same time, we wanted to highlight the fact that the content, because they become a content creative platform, the idea, content is king. And so I was looking at this notion of content is king and also try to integrate with their original design. So I thought, well, if content is king, why don't we just make it into a content king? Um, so I uh, started to draw this content king and also uh, integrate it with the prism, which is the original logo, and also the color scheme, the, the, the blue and the pink, and it winks in the end, um, into a character. And this character also is not only standing alone, but also can be used as a campaign mascot. Uh, so it could be a poster, it also uh, could be, <laughs> this is what we put, like we put poster around in the, in the convention center, um, and it kind of just like looking at you from afar. And we also take him on the Sixth Street when the music festival started, and it was kind of fun, because you, you know, people, this is like four years ago, and people kind of started to really interact with the, the character and take photos. This is before, this is before Snapchat. Um, and what's also very interesting is we had an idea of having um, a photo booth that we can actually, um, because people are gonna come over and they, they're gonna ask you questions and, and, and they also try to find out what you do. But a lot of times you're gonna have some sort of interesting uh, sort of novel idea to, to interact and engage with your consumer or potential consumer. And so what happened is we have all these props that, and it's a physical prop. It's not just like on your phone, it's actually a physical prop. This is the team actually having fun before the, before the whole show started. And so people could actually come over and take a photo with the animated GIF. This is like, again, before Snapchat. And what's really interesting here is people who come over to the booth is actually willing to interact with the actual brand, it, like physically interacting with the brand, but in the same time, they're willing to um, send photos to themselves or email their colleague their, their fun pictures, and they're willing to leave their digital footprint without you asking for this. So that was a very interesting kind of interacting but also engaging experience at South Bay. Um, we also made stickers and um, and, and bags, and here's one of the fun trick. They, ma they made the bag twice as big as the official bag so that everybody could put more stuff in it. That was a, that was a really successful hack. I think it was on day two, all the bags were gone, and you see like, just people are just like, oh, walking with, with, with the bag as well. So that's a trick. We'll see how big the bag gets next year. Um, so this is the team with all the, all the props by the end of it. This is actually before the, the whole show started, and by the end of the show, uh, all the props were gone. People like it so much, they're like, can we keep it, and, which is good for us, because we have less thing to carry back. Um, so here's the takeaway. The takeaway is content is king was introduced in 1996, actually popularized by Bill Gates. And uh, now it's 2018, and 22 years later, I would like to introduce um, engagement is queen. When you put, um, meaningful content with engaging form together, 
when you put tech and art together, um, this is where the innovation happens, and really kind of this is where the magic happens. And so this is the whole takeaway. Um, I for integrate, N for nurture, S for symbolize, P for personify, I for infuse, R for research, and E for engage. And when you put it together, it's inspire. And I think the most important thing when we do creative work or when we do marketing or we do branding or any, any work really um, is, is, you know, the, the breath. Really, inspire is this gap between our, our breathing. So if you can bring this fresh breath into the world, if you can inspire more people, and in the same time, inspire yourself of any project you're working on, um, you will be able to successfully communicate to a global audience. So thank you so much, and uh, let's stay in touch. Thanks, everyone. So um, I'm going to look through the Slido. And also feel free, I prefer human interaction. So feel free to get onto the stage while I'm reading the questions. Ask me anything. What is the one piece in your portfolio that you're really proud of? Uh, the next one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Miss or Mr. or Ms. Anonymous. Being inspired by Conan, what was your most amazing thing that happened to you? I think the most amazing thing happened to me was I was able to see the strength when I am weak, when I'm not inspired, or when I'm in fear. I was able to have the strength to conquer the, the fear. And I think a creative experience is always this dance between fear and gaining the strength to you know, pursue and keep going and finding your home and do your work. And I love this book by Elizabeth Gilbert, The Big Magic, and I would suggest everybody read it. Um, it's really kind of able to be able to, in, like, I think doing any creative work, it's in search of this magic moment, in search of this moment of realization, in search of this moment of giving birth of something that truly means something to you or to your audience. So that's, I think, the biggest moment um, inspired by Conan. As a designer, is it hard to be always so creative? When do you get your inspiration? And did it ever happen to you there was no creativity in you? So I have already told you the story. I think that's a, that's a longer version of, of this. I mean, there's always a lot of times you know, ups and downs, just like life. And I think the, the way that I get inspiration is really kind of try to connect with people. And, and sometimes, a lot of times, connect with the nature um, and uh, uh, listen to music and, and maybe talk to other creators. Um, and, and also talking to other people. I think the creative experience that I had at IDEO really get me a chance to see people who are doing, you know, the work or their career being perceived as very kind of analytical could be also very creative. And, and my passion and the, the project that I'm working on right now, which is still in the very early stage, um, so I decided to run my own studio and I started in last year. And I try to engage with more companies just like what I did at IDEO. But the next step I would like to do is engaging not only with design company but also with tech companies and, and able to almost bring this fun and joy and, and playfulness into the workspace. It's, think, it, think of it as a creative gym or, or a, a fun sort of playful um, space for people so that it will allow people to really interact and um, create this inspirational or magical moment together, which they don't know, and I don't know either. Um, I can give you one more bonus story, which is very short. Um, there is the reason why that I moved to San Francisco, the reason why, I mean, I didn't even know where San Francisco, I mean, I didn't even know where Silicon Valley is 10 years ago. I mean, I had to Google map it, and it's, it's like Google map, like, place is not found. Um, so uh, really one thing that changed, changed my uh, trajectory, it's not a career, it's, it's a calling. 
um, is that I was working uh, uh, in Twitter as a freelancing person. Like I was contracting with them, and I was working on a project to make uh, a mascot uh, for the capacity team. And it was like a really fun project they did as a side project. And so at the time when um, I, I you know, worked on this project, I talked to the manager um, who is a very serious guy. He never smiled, and he's this very buff, very serious guy. And, and we were working on this project to together for like a month. Obviously, his main job is looking after the 40 engineer people. And I remember by the end of the project, um, we had the mascot printed on a t-shirt, and he saved a, a t-shirt for me, and he gave me as a present. And he said, Ying, actually, I want to tell you something that my team didn't even know. Um, about 20 years ago, I was actually a graphic designer. Um, and I had to give it up because I started a family. I kind of wanted to have more stable income. And you know, it just doesn't fulfill at the time as a graphic designer. So I, I, I started to learn to code, and I became an engineer. And ever since in the last 20 years, I always felt something was missing. But I don't, I'm not quite sure what that is. It was interesting that working with you in the last month or so, even though this is a complete side project, but it doesn't really feel like working. It feels like taking a break. So thank you very much. And he gave me the t-shirt. And I remembered vividly all these people surrounded by us, the team member. They were just like, we've never seen him like this. What did you do? You just broke him. Um, and um, I thought. That was the moment I realized that being physically in a space and having a human interaction, more than email, more than Slack, more than you know, um, Facebook, this energy exchange is so powerful. And I think this is kind of my gift that I needed to give uh, to the community, the, the, not only the tech community, but I think the community in large. And that was the reason why that I decided to, to move to Silicon Valley, to San Francisco. And I hope that more and more people are going to join me. I hope this is going to be a movement. I'm actually working on a project that really kind of may be able to have a, a, this capacity of creating more art with people. Uh, not only in the tech space, but in workspace in general. So this is kind of what I'm really excited about next. So the last question, do, do you have any tips for designers who may need to create one set of symbol to be used in many countries? It's a very specific question. Um, one set of symbols to be, whether it, is, it, is it food, or is it, is it going to be, uh, what, what is, like, who is this anonymous? Is he or she still there? Can you explain your question? OK. I don't think, is he or she here? OK, I don't think they're there. They're probably like, just like, oh. I, I can email you back if, you, if, you, um, if you're still around. Um, is there any other questions that you'd like to ask? Oh, oh, hi. Yeah, sure. OK. <laughs> hi. Can I have a question? Yes, nice to meet you. Uh, Freddie Jinkow. Yeah, good Thanks. to see you. OK. Nice to meet you. So um, do you want me to speak in the mic? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. OK. So you have worked on, so you're a very ambitious person. <laughs> OK. And you have worked with a variety. I'll take it. <laughs> you have worked with a variety of of like companies, industries, right. um, from all across the globe. That's a variety. And um, I want to know, how did, you keep, how did you keep your drive of being a can? Being a what? A can. A can? Yeah, cultural artsy nerd. Oh. Don't be a can't, be a can. Cultural artsy nerd. I love it. Yeah. This is the first time I learned this word. <laughs> Should it's make a, a t-shirt. It's a term that I've coined. Um, be a can. It stands for people like you, me, individuals who um, have been like, impacted, influenced by that cult, that cross culture, yeah. and who has just like, um, who's just very artsy, you know? Individuals <laughs> who've like prided themselves on creating or designing or producing, um, just, just pro you know, um, that has like producing, designing, creating all on that artsy level, and who's just so passionate about it, who's just like that nerd, who's just like that, just like, God, I just love being a can, you know? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Wow, I really feel the energy now. Um, I didn't have any coffee today, by the way. Um, I, 
I think firstly, thank you for giving me this question in person. Um, uh, this is a really good question, and I always believe this, because people always say, you know, where's your home, where's your home? And I feel that home is, yeah, sunsets. home is where your heart is, or home is where your laundry is, yeah. really. Um, yeah. But, but I, 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 believe, I believe if your home is, I mean, if, if your heart is big enough, then anywhere can be your home, even if you don't speak the language. Even you probably have never traveled there, but you feel home. So I think at the end of the day, the drive is just the sheer enjoyment. Or, or I don't want to be corny, but it's really kind of the love of life or the love of people. But I think the best practice is communicate and understand and, um, and also be able to share. I agree. You want it to share with more people. And that's your gift. And realizing that gift realizing that you're here for a reason, the purpose, the meaning, will give you so much strength, even though you probably go through the darkest moment in your life, or any, I have to be honest with you, I was injured about a month and a half ago. Um, it's crazy, I went to do a yoga class, I probably didn't drink enough milk, um, and I get pressed on the floor, and um, I had a crack on my rib bone. Um, so I was freaked out. I, did, I didn't want to tell anybody like before I came, because I was really scared that I wasn't able to do this presentation at all. Because even taking a plane, I was coming from another country. I was worried that I wasn't able to get onto the stage. But knowing that you guys are going to be here for me, and also knowing that I, I know it's late in the afternoon, knowing that you're here means so much to me. So thank you so much. Uh, it, means, it means an honor. I, I love you. You're so awesome. Thank you so much. Never stop being a parent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.